The adoption of increasingly capable long-range air-launched munitions has granted new life to elder statesmen like the B-52 Stratofortress, but the Air Force's Rapid Dragon program is taking that concept to the next level. Rapid Dragon will turn America's cargo aircraft into missile-packing arsenal planes, and if you've never thought about a C-130 sinking a destroyer before, this is the video for you. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. I've gotten requests to cover Rapid Dragon from a bunch of people in the comments below a bunch of videos, so it was about time I dove into this very cool program. It might seem counterintuitive to fly massive radar reflecting platforms like the C-130 Hercules or the C-17 Globemaster anywhere near contested airspace just to deploy munitions, but the promise behind Rapid Dragon isn't really to send these hulking airframes into harm's way. Instead, the effort leverages palletized standoff weapons, weapons like the AGM-158 Joint Air-to-Surface Standoff Missile, or JASM, with ranges that can exceed a thousand miles. This will allow cargo aircraft to deploy ordnance from well beyond the reach of enemy air defenses, and according to the Air Force, it would allow them to saturate that enemy airspace with a large volume of low observable cruise missiles for a relatively low cost and a pretty low risk. But the real value in Rapid Dragon may not be just inundating enemy airspace with weapons and drones, it may be hunting ships. The name Rapid Dragon is actually an homage to an ancient Chinese siege weapon that saw use around 950 AD called the Jilong Shu. I apologize if I pronounced that wrong, but it roughly translates to Rapid Dragon Carts. These weapons were effectively crossbow catapults that allowed a single user to pull one trigger to launch as many as 12 arrows all at once. And to quote the Air Force Research Laboratory, like its namesake, these palletized munitions promise to unleash mighty salvos in mass on distant adversaries. Now, if you've done any reading about Rapid Dragon, you already know that. But what I find sort of ironic is that the Rapid Dragon weapon system may prove most valuable in a conflict against the nation from which it draws its very name. A fight with China would inevitably be a fight in the Pacific, and thanks to low observable long-range munitions like the JASM family of cruise missiles, cargo aircraft could saturate enemy airspace with missiles, take out whole fleets of enemy ships, or lay mines across vast expanses of ocean, all without ever coming within range of Chinese air defense systems. The underlying concept behind using America's existing commercial and cargo aircraft to ferry and launch missiles has been around for a while, but it saw a lot of interest in the 1970s in particular. In the early 70s, Henry Kissinger's efforts to regain the nuclear upper hand over the Soviet Union before entering strategic arms reduction talks led to what's known as the Air Mobility Feasibility Demonstration Program. Now, as benign sounding as that mouthful of words, may seem, it was anything but. Over just 90 days in 1974, the program proved that the U.S. could actually launch a 57-foot, 87,000-pound LGM-30 Minuteman I nuclear ICBM out the back of an airborne C-5 cargo aircraft from practically anywhere. The fast-paced program culminated in a live fire demonstration of an inert ICBM, but after proving this unusual method of deployment was not only possible, it was downright feasible, the U.S. actually opted to shelf the capability. You see, mutually assured destruction is usually cited as the driving force behind the U.S. and Soviet Union matching capabilities, but a few programs, like the Air Mobility Feasibility Demonstration Program, represent the opposite side of that same coin. Programs like it and the nuclear-powered SLAM missile ultimately saw cancellation or indefinite pauses either to prevent the Soviet Union from pursuing the same technology or out of concern that it created a potent enough advantage that it might actually prompt the Soviets to launch a first strike just to prevent that advantage from being leveraged. 
The concept of using cargo aircraft to deploy missiles emerged once again later in that same decade, after the Carter administration announced the cancellation of the supersonic heavy payload B-1B bomber program. With the B-2 being developed behind a veil of classified funding, the U.S. looked like it was cruising toward a gap in its ability to deliver ordnance by air, and that resulted in a Boeing proposal to use the 747-200C as an arsenal ship, packed to the gills with AGM-86 air-launched cruise missiles. Now, the concept might sound crazy, but it actually really had legs. The B-52 was able to carry around 20 of these 1,500-mile range missiles, but the proposed 747 Cruise Missile Carrier Aircraft, or CMCA, would have flown with a whopping 72. The weapons would have been brought on board with pre-programmed targeting data, but that data could have been adjusted in flight from the command center and the aircraft. They then would have been launched one at a time in rapid succession from a door near its tail. Because there was a production line already in operation and global infrastructure to support the aircraft, the 747 CMCA seemed both promising and cost-effective. But as you probably know, the B-1B Lancer was brought back from the dead, and the B-2 Spirit followed soon thereafter, and the rest is just history. But if you're interested in learning more about these programs, I've actually got videos and articles on each. I'll leave links in the description below. But for now, let's get back to Rapid Dragon, because the concept isn't actually all that dissimilar from the 747 CMCA in a number of important ways. Like the CMCA program, Rapid Dragon aims to use long-range air-launched cruise missiles to keep the vulnerable arsenal plane out of harm's way. Its cruise missiles are also brought on board with target data already plugged in, but as demonstrated in a flight test late last year, that target data can be changed by the crew on board the aircraft mid-flight. But as economically feasible as the 747 CMCA concept may have been, Rapid Dragon takes the financial efficiency of this premise even further. Rather than customizing specific aircraft for the Arsenal plane role, Rapid Dragon uses self-contained palletized munitions they call deployment boxes that can be loaded aboard any C-130 in a six-missile magazine or any C-17 in a nine-missile configuration. These pallets are loaded aboard the aircraft like any other, and then deployed while airborne without any modifications to the aircraft itself, in what the Air Force Research Laboratory calls roll-on, roll-off capability. Once the order's been given to deploy the weapons, the crew on board the cargo aircraft go about their business just like any standard airdrop, with parachutes deploying to orient the deployment box for subsequent launches. Once the deployment box is good and stable, the onboard control box begins releasing the JASM cruise missiles individually to prevent them from conflicting with one another as they launch. Each missile then deploys its wings and control surfaces, fires up its engines, pulls up into its traditionally horizontal flight path, and heads off for its target. The primary weapon system the Air Force envisions using with Rapid Dragon is the AGM-158 JASM, which, when it first entered service, was a 14-foot, 2,251-pound weapon that could deliver a 1,000-pound warhead to targets about 230 miles away. But by 2006, the Air Force was already testing the JASM ER, which offered the same external dimensions with a jump in range to 575 miles. Last year in 2021, low rate initial production began on the latest iteration, known as the AGM 158D JASM XR, which boasts a range in excess of 1,000 miles, which gives the Rapid Dragon concept some serious reach. And to make matters that much worse for potential targets, these weapons are considered fairly low cost at usually around $2 million a piece, and they're also considered to be pretty stealthy, which makes them hard to detect and even harder to intercept. Now, this family of weapons also includes the AGM-158C, long-range anti-ship missile, which means Rapid Dragon can effectively turn cargo aircraft into serious ship-hunting platforms for use over the vast expanses of the Pacific. In fact, last December, 
the Air Force announced successfully hitting a maritime target with a cruise missile deployed from a C-130 as part of the same program. Right now, Rapid Dragon is focused on six weapon deployment boxes for the C-130 and a nine weapon configuration for the C-17, but part of the effort includes expanding on both the number and types of weapons employed to allow for greater mission variety. And because the entire apparatus is contained within the deployment box itself, the same C-130 or C-17 that was ferrying cargo between installations on Monday can feasibly be used to saturate enemy airspace with cruise missiles on Tuesday before getting back to its regular cargo hauling duties on Wednesday. Of course, cargo planes aren't the only way you can launch these weapons. They can also be carried by a number of fighters, and B-52s can actually carry 20 of them at a time. But there's good reason to use cargo aircraft in conjunction with these other platforms. Right now, the U.S. Air Force maintains a fleet of around 75 B-52s, and these bombers fill a variety of roles within America's force structure, particularly as the conspicuous portion of the airborne leg of the nation's nuclear triad. Now, 75 isn't a small number, but with the Air National Guard and Air Force Reserves included, the Air Force can bring more than 400 C-130s of various types into the fight, along with an additional 220 or so C-17s. So rather than worrying about fewer than 100 heavy payload bombers deploying a large number of these standoff weapons, potential opponents now have to worry about literally hundreds of deployment systems, each capable of launching a half dozen or more missiles at a time, with existing operational infrastructure already in place all over the world. And while the B-52 costs somewhere in the neighborhood of $70,000 per hour to fly, the various forms of the C-130 mostly cost under $10,000 per hour, with a few notable exceptions, and can fly from austere airstrips that most bombers would never even dream of. And the fighters and bombers that these cargo aircraft can free up can then go conduct other operations that make haul for their more specialized capability sets. So while Rapid Dragon does obviously represent a big boost in the amount of ordnance that can be sent down range at once, it might shine brightest when you consider how easy it would be to transition these capabilities to allies. The C-130 is among the most widely operated military aircraft in the world, with more than 2,500 airframes delivered to 63 different nations since production began in the 50s, and at least seven other countries have bought them secondhand. Because the Rapid Dragon deployment boxes are designed to be roll-on, roll-off, with target data already programmed in ahead of time, the U.S. could literally provide these systems to allies, converting their own cargo fleets into ship-busting arsenal planes as well. When considering large-scale warfare in terms of cost, the ability to deploy a large volume of low-observable, long-range cruise missiles into enemy airspace from a wide variety of aircraft is a good thing. But the ability to quickly provide that same capability to allies within a region with very little training required and while leveraging their existing aircraft and infrastructure is practically unheard of. In a conflict with China, for instance, Japan's fleet of C-130s could also deploy cruise missiles or even drones via Rapid Dragon right alongside American airlift platforms, further increasing the number of airframes available for the fight and the number of missiles or drones deployed. These weapons could also be used for electronic warfare or the suppression of enemy air defenses. Air defense systems that attempt to intercept this swarm of weapons would be quickly depleted of interceptors, making the airspace that much safer for the Allied aircraft following behind. That capability becomes all the more pronounced when you consider the use of these systems to deploy a large number of anti-ship missiles, which likely offer a range comparable to the ER at around 575 miles. China's naval presence in the Pacific is significant, and when you consider their large militia and Coast Guard vessels as well, it outnumbers America's global navy by better than two to one. China's most advanced long-range air defense systems, however, can't engage targets beyond 200 miles or so, making a C-130 packed to the gills with 500-plus mile anti-ship missiles a serious threat to their naval supremacy in the Pacific.
Chinese analysts have publicly claimed that because the long-range anti-ship missile is the most expensive of the JASM family, at around $4 million apiece, this approach to anti-ship warfare isn't sustainable. But when you consider the cost and time required to replace an advanced warship, like China's Type 055 destroyers, a handful of long-range anti-ship missiles is a bargain. And since we're already waist deep in the hypothetical, indulge me for a minute, because I think it's worth discussing something that legendary Navy Admiral James Flatley told me last year. Flatley's the only man ever to land a C-130 on an aircraft carrier, but he didn't just do it. He proved it was borderline practical. Landing and taking off again from the deck of the USS Forrestal dozens of times before the exercise was over. After we published a story about his effort and I put up a video on YouTube, Admiral Flatley reached out to me through his son Seamus, who's also an accomplished naval aviator, and I got the chance to sit down and talk with him for a while about his time aboard America's Flat Tops. During our conversation about him successfully landing a C-130 Hercules on the Forrestal and taking off again more than once, he made it clear to me that while using the C-130 to resupply carriers at sea seemed unnecessary to the Navy at the time, they've kept the capability in their back pocket, just in case some large-scale conflict ever kicked off and provided them with good enough reason to see the mighty Hercules return to the decks of America's airfields at sea. Would the Navy ever want to fly C-130s off their carriers again? I honestly couldn't tell you, but it's some interesting food for thought to close on. And with that ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure to swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to click like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.